So The Romans is very different to the serials that came before. As a writer of comedy, Dennis Spooner tried something very different with this serial, a farcical historical. A complete change of the genre, while Doctor Who has always had humorous moments, most prominent in Spooner's previous serial, The Romans goes above and beyond in that regard, with constant jokes and slapstick. But does this serial impress, or does it go too far and become annoying? And like with all other historicals, does it succeed in being educational about the time period and characters involved? Let's find out. So starting where we left off with the rescue, the TARDIS falls off of a cliff. From there we cut to a month later where the Doctor and Co had been squatting in someone's house. I said he had become a more moral character last time, I never said anything about his obedience to the law. These first few scenes are so much fun as we see the new quartet living together. We have a scene of the Doctor and Ian relaxing in the villa, with the Doctor taking care of the plants, which also allows for some historical information about the Romans' aqueducts. You see, the Romans, unfortunately, didn't know how to transport water satisfactorily. That's why they built their aqueducts. But really, the best scene is where they're all together having just eaten. Hartle's performance at the Doctor's delight at the food is just incredible. Well, the main course was breast of peacock. <laughs> Delicious. With an orange and juniper sauce. Oh, exquisite. Mm. Garnished with lark's tongues and baked pomegranates. Oh, fabulous, my dear. Absolutely <laughs> fabulous. Plus the Doctor using French, which doesn't exist yet. Vicky pointing this out to him is so cheeky of her. He sort of hors d'oeuvre, so to speak. That mm. isn't its name. French isn't uh, invented yet. Yeah. child. <laughs> But it gives this sense of them knowing each other so well already, despite it only having been a mum since they met. These character moments continue when the Doctor reveals he's heading to Rome. Not after a discussion with anyone, he just announces it while gathering up some fruit. Well, I think these should last me two or three days. Hmm? You never told us you were going away. Oh? Well, I don't know that I was under any obligation to report my movements to you, Chesterfield. Chester Tun. Oh, Barbara's calling you. This is quite different to the Doctor as we know him, very casually leaving without prior discussion. He's becoming a very different character to who he was in series one. Vicky decides to go with the Doctor, allowing for them to bond across the serial, and show the audience how his pair's dynamic works. Vicky being Susan's replacement, how does he treat Vicky compared to his granddaughter? This leaves Ian and Barbara alone for the first time in who knows how long. I'll leave their activities up to interpretation. But this gets interrupted by the arrival of slavers, who having seen Barbara and Vicky in the market earlier, now have come to enslave them. A fight ensues with Barbara hitting Ian over the head with a vase. While heading to Rome, the Doctor is mistaken to be the famous liar player, Maximus Petalian, who was previously killed. This is how the Doctor ended up with his liar, which allowed for the mistaken identification. This is what allows the Doctor and Vicky an audience with Caesar Nero. Now something important to note about Nero in this serial is that he's written to be a complete idiot, more obsessed with his own ego in pursuit of women rather than actually ruling over Rome and the greater Roman Empire. He invited Maximus Battalion to Rome in order to show off his ability at playing the liar, and later when the Doctor makes a fool of him with his own abilities, he plans to kill him. We also learn that Maximus Battalion was assassinated on his way to Rome, as he had a plan to kill Nero, which leads to an assassination attempt on the Doctor, which goes well for the assassin. Oh, so you want to fight, this is such a different side to the Doctor, a far more physical side as he completely overpowers his assassin, and while we would later see the Doctor fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat, unlike those fights, this one has a strong comedic edge to it. The Doctor also plays with his assassin, throwing water over him and laughing throughout. Vicky enters mid-fight and attempts to ruin a valuable antique, but the assassin escapes before she can smash it over his head. And I want to know if the Doctor's a delight again to fight someone. Young lady, why did you have to come in and interrupt just as I got him all softened up? and ready for the old one to... You know, I am so constantly outwitting the opposition, I tend to forget the delights and satisfaction of the arts, the gentle art of physica. He's so very casual about all this. So with the Doctor and Vicky in Rome, we'll get back to Ian and Barbara, who have been split up. Ian, having been sold almost immediately, has spent five days manning the oars of a slave ship. Now, I do have to say that this is probably the weakest plot line in the serial. It takes Ian far longer to reach Rome than the rest of the quartet, and he doesn't do as much as the others when it comes to the overall plot. He meets a fellow slave named Delos, and escapes from the ship during a storm, but that's everything before his arrival in Rome. Barbara, on the other hand, has a far more interesting plot line. Now being alone, she is taken to Rome where she is to be sold to the highest bidder, this ending up being a man named Tavius, who is a high-ranking member of Nero's court. Tavius is also a contact which Maximus Battalion was to meet with to put the plan to kill Nero into action, and right now we begin to see the difficulty in explaining this serial. All the plot lines are separate and at the same time weave together. Ian and Barbara's come together later while being separate from the Doctor and Vicky's, but both share characters and there is some crossover in events. This is best shown off when Nero's wife, Papaya, attempts to have Barbara poisoned, but Vicky overhears this and switches the goblet so the Doctor has to prevent the potential death of Nero. This also leads to Nero casually killing his servant, Tigellinus. Tigellinus?
He was right. But what's important to note is that Vicky didn't know that it was Barbara to be poisoned, and instead all she knew was it was to be a servant. So while they overlap, the two main plot lines never interact. I think the scene where Nero chases Barbara through the palace is a great visual depiction of this, as Barbara nearly runs into the Doctor and Vicky, but they just miss each other, while Nero ends up having to interact with them. I wish I'd probably explain why Barbara is being chased by Nero. So after being bought by Tavius, Barbara is put into the service of Papaya as her servant. This is how she meets Nero, who becomes infatuated with Barbara, and so both figuratively and literally, he pursues her. This is why Papaya wants Barbara dead, as she is a threat to her. And like with the Reign of Terror in the previous series, Dennis Spoon's comedy is incredible here. Nero's pursuit of Barbara isn't funny, but the events which befall Nero are. We have him falling over things, his frustration at losing his prey, and his odd ways of trying to impress her. Most notably... Now, close your eyes and Nero will give you a big surprise. Nero is played entirely for laughs as a character, and as the serial proceeds, he becomes more and more stupid, to the point where it can become scary when you remember that he is the ruler of the Roman Empire. And like other depictions which present Nero as a tyrant, this one presents him as being so stupid he is to be feared. Moving back to the plot, the Doctor is to play the liar for Nero and many others at a large banquet, but knowing he can't play, and having already used every excuse under the sun to escape playing, he creates a clever plot. This plot being to pretend to play music so delicate that only those who trained hearing can hear it, when in reality he's playing nothing and hoping that nobody says anything. <laughs> Thank you! With the Doctor explaining that his idea was similar to that of the Emperor's new clothes, and claims that he gave the idea to Hans Christian Andersen. It's the old fairy story, child. The Emperor's new clothes. I gave it as an idea to Hans Andersen. <laughs> this performance annoys Nero to the extent that he puts in motion his own plans to kill the Doctor. Getting back to Ian, he and Delos get to Rome, but are recaptured and taken to the cells. The same cells which Barbara was taken to, which leads to Ian learning she's in Rome. This is where they're told that they will fight in the arena, against stock footage of lions. <laughs> but instead they are forced to fight one another for Nero's entertainment. Now episode 3 really shows how little Ian has to do in this serial, as the episode 2 cliffhanger is him being put into the cells, and the episode 3 cliffhanger is Ian about to be killed in the fight. He gets two short scenes in the middle of the episode. One is where he learns that Barbara is in Rome, and the other is him saying that he's going to find her. Very little of anything important to the overall plot. So Ian is forced to fight Delos, for Nero, who has brought Barbara with him, which is how she and Ian reunite. Sort of. Despite Delos having Ian at his mercy, and Nero demanding his death, Ian and Delos fight the soldiers together, and are able to escape, but are forced to leave Barbara. This is where we get another iconic moment which depicts Nero's stupidity in a terrifying way, when he insists that a dead soldier continues to fight. Get up, you tyrant, mate! Get up! Your Caesar commands it! Plus, in the same vein, we have this. <laughs> he didn't fight hard enough. The look on Barbara's face says it all. The further into the serial we get, the more Spooner is able to show off Nero as the stupid tyrant, and when away from the lighter Doctor story, it really allows for some pretty dark moments. Speaking of the Doctor, he is informed by Tavius that Nero intends to feed him to the lions, and so must escape. With this information, the Doctor takes full advantage of the situation by teasing Nero. You want me to play in the arena? <laughs> you guessed. Well, I promise you, I shall try to make it a roaring success. Something that they can really get their teeth into. This is such a great twist of the Doctor's lording it over people with his intelligence. Rather than the threatening villain we saw in series 1, we've now got a comical genius who is outplaying Nero and crushing him. But with his attention divided, the Doctor accidentally sets fire to Nero's plans for a new Rome, giving Nero the idea to burn down Rome, allowing him to build his new Rome. Now for a little context, it's unknown if Nero was responsible for the burning down of Rome in 64 AD, with varying stories. But the serial confirms that in the Doctor Who timeline, that it was Nero who was responsible. This makes this what can be described as the first clarification of the alternative history within the show. Nero's plans give Ian the opportunity to sneak into the palace where he reunites with Barbara, who is being assisted to escape by Tavius. Together at last they escape from Rome before it burns, while at the same time the Doctor and Vicky begin their way back to the villa. As they are, they stop for a break and watch as Rome burns, in one of those shots which probably didn't even hold up on broadcast. This is where Vicky says to the Doctor, It's a pity they got it all wrong. Got it all wrong? What do you mean, child? Hmm? Well, they didn't mention you. Well, of course not. Why should they? Well, it was you <laughs> who gave Nero the idea, wasn't it? Now here we have a potential change to what we've seen before and how the changing of history has been handled. As in both the Aztecs and the Reign of Terror, time was presented as being this unchangeable thing. History will run its course no matter what. Something the Doctor acknowledges here. Nothing to do with me? You burnt his drawing. You can't possibly accuse me of, 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 of that. But I will argue that this isn't a change. 
change and instead the next step in developing the rules. As the Doctor now sees he can have an influence on history, but only to the extent that it plays out as it always has. While he believes Rome would always burn even if he wasn't there, this time he plays a part in history. Let's settle this, insinuating that all this is my fault. My fault? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! And as Rome burns, Nero plays the liar, showing his complete insanity. <laughs> Ian and Barbara are able to reach the villa before the Doctor and Vicky, giving them a chance to clean up the mess from the fight, which must have been nearly two weeks prior. After getting revenge for Barbara's joke about the fridge from before, he learns that it was in fact Barbara who hit him over the head, leading to Ian getting his vengeance. The Doctor and Vicky return, casually accuse Ian and Barbara of being lazy before deciding to return to the TARDIS. They take off and head into the unknown. A quick discussion about the events of the serial occur, but Ian and Barbara don't get a chance to reveal that they were in Rome, and Vicky learns that the Doctor has no control over the ship, but doesn't believe the others. Vicky and Barbara leave the console room, leaving the Doctor and Ian to discuss the arising situation. The TARDIS has momentarily materialised and been grabbed by some force, dragging them down. I wouldn't have thought it possible, but somehow we've materialised for a split second of time and been imprisoned in some kind of force. I simply can't break its hold. We are being slowly dragged down. Dragged down? Hmm. To what? So the Romans is a very funny serial. There's no way around that. While Spooner's previous serial also had plenty of laughs, it wasn't taken to the same extent as this one. The quartet, well half of them, are presented in a more humorous way than usual. And all of this is contrasted against the darker tones of the slavery story, with Nero being able to be a part in both, being a fool when he's with the Doctor and Vicky, while a dangerous tyrant while with Barbara. I will note though that like with his previous historical, Spooner doesn't get across much in the way of history, although unlike with the Reign of Terror, that gap is filled by the far greater humour. Coming out of the serial, I don't know a whole lot more about the Romans and their empire, plus the motivations behind Tavius wanting to kill Nero aren't explained, with the exception of his final scene, where he's shown watching Rome burn while holding a cross. Now there is no dialogue actually explaining this, but looking into the details of history, Tavius is a Christian, who were prosecuted by Emperor Nero. Now I might have missed some setup for this, but I don't recall anything which hints towards this persecution by Nero, and so Tavius' motivations end up falling flat without outside context. I do think it's a great serial overall, it's very different to everything which came before, and a lot of what is to come from the show. It's another banger of a historical which sticks out against the rest. But the TARDIS is being dragged down by an unknown force. What awaits the quartet? Could it be unimaginable horrors? A new enemy which will make a mark on the show going forwards? Or will it be a very dull serial? Next time, The Web Planet. <laughs>